<laughs> Ew, Michael. Why are you beatboxing on my box set? Box set? What box set? My Endless Summer Limited Edition box set, silly. It's filled with a book that's meticulously crafted with five different types of paper printed on full color. What? It has a remastered DVD and never-before-seen photos. Wow! Where do you get that from, Danielle? Get it at the link in our bio. Hell yeah! Yeah! Hey everybody, welcome to the Quivercast. You go left, I go right. Man, this wave is out of sight. Going surfing, going surfing, going surfing with friends. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Quivercast. And guess what? I'm super happy today. I was able to get in contact with Davey Miller. How are you doing, Davey? I'm good. good. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Thank you. Thank you for doing this show. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. Yeah, right on. You know, the, the earliest memories that I have of you like, is in the magazines. You had quite a bit of photos in the, in the mags back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the magazines, you know, a lot of people would say, that, you know, I'm from California, uh, the magazines, you know, surfer and surfing magazine are California magazines at the time, California was sort of hard up for surfers who enjoyed bigger surf. And to be honest, you know, most of the surfers, um, even world champion surfers, Mm -hmm. uh, were pretty timid in pipeline and big, you know, big surf. They rode waves, but didn't really just, you know, animalize on them. And so uh, I was, I was kind of just given a lot, and it was really helpful for me in the sense that it helped me to, you know, it was like a point of purchase when I was painting paintings, and mm-hmm. you know, guys like um, I was able to make friends with a lot of guys that I idolized and just worshipped when I was a little kid, and right. ended up painting for Lopez and Nat Young wow. and Jack Sutherland and, uh, you know, and all this huge laundry list of guys that I would have never imagined even meeting. So um, it, it was a blessing for sure. A lot of people didn't like it, you know, for whatever individual reasons people might think or assume that somebody who gets pictures in the mags is, uh, you know, that's why they came to Hawaii is to get in the mags. And that's, that wasn't my reasoning. I was never into, uh, the pro tour contest scene at all, but just felt, uh, drawn. And my whole life's ambition was to live and surf on the North shore for as long as I possibly could. Do you remember the first time you went to the North shore? How old were you? Yeah. Uh, 19, 20 years old. I, my birthday is December 28th. So, um, I believe it was, 79 80 okay the pro class trials at sunset had a few years in a row of just absolutely monster perfect like world-class sunset beach yeah where there was like west the north coming off the point into the outside west bowl you know coming all the way through and the inside section unfolding without you know whipping it around on the inside having already been on the wave, like Mm -hmm. basically that inside section, that's exactly what it is. It's the inside section. (laughs) Okay. And, uh, now it's the whole game there. Mostly, uh, for whatever reasons, I'm not really sure, but, um, we had a nice lucky stint of, uh, good surf on the, in the, in the sunset, uh, trials there. So you, you go to Hawaii and you, and you put yourself in the contest. Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went over there, and a- Alan Main, um, he shaped surfboards for me at the time, mm-hmm. and he got me entered into the pro class trials. And my older brother, Donnie Romalo, and Alan Main were filmers. They filmed 16 millimeter mm. for years, and they were the only guys that would go over and film young Michael Ho, Timmy Carvalho, you know, some of the unknown 
you know, Hawaiian rippers at Velziland and also capturing rare footage of Barry Kaniapuni wow. riding short boards at Velzi at big like maxing Velziland, big for Velziland, which is like, you know, four to six foot, wash mm -hmm. through, double up. And uh, I was so inspired by Michael Ho, Timmy Carvalho at the time, and especially Barry Kanaipuni. You know, I just was like a typical little kid. I mean, I, I would watch the surf films and yeah. we had them in my house. I literally had all this footage, you know, of everyone, you know, Jerry, Rory, Ricky Rasmussen, you know, Jackie Dunn, all these guys. And I got to like Alan and them would leave the house and I'd go get into it and pull out the projector and just sit and watch films for hours. Raw footage? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, not, not, there was like the batch that they would be working on. They had a few different copies. Wow. So that, you know, cool. So that I could go in and, and, and watch the stuff without uh, taking a chance on ruining the, yes. the, you know, the edit, the main batch. And yeah. I was just so blessed. It's so and, rad. um, and so I was able to visualize Sunset Beach and being an artist, I'm able to visualize Okay. and my imagination is very strong. Mm -hmm. So when I got off the plane, actually, I was ready to surf Sunset when I was 16. So we were so poor. My mom, she didn't even pay for like NSSA. I was never able to surf in the amateur ranks. And mm -hmm. So, you know, contests were like... I don't know. It was just not my thing. Right. But Sunset Beach, being able to go out and surf Sunset with four guys in the water and the then dream. pipeline. Uh, sounds like a dream. You know, that's I never got over that rush. And, <laughs> and you know, you know, getting, <laughs> yeah, that's getting through getting through heats. It just meant I get to surf for another 30 minutes or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, with no one out, you know, at my dream lifetime, dream ambition surf spot. And then because Alan Maine's rocker was like, he was taught by Brewer. Mm -hmm. So his boards were, you know, thicker, but they had the good primo rocker and uh, without, you know, any weird change ups in the nose and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And the boards were like toboggans, you know, they were, he really had a great feel for boards shaped for Sunset Beach. Wow. Single fin uh, with a thicker fiberglass and wooden base mm -hmm. that they cut through the water real buttery and so single fin pintails honestly to this day uh, part of me likes single fins more at sunset than wow. uh other That's interesting. you know it, well if you use the right fin you know not necessarily just the shape but the foil yeah. using the thicker beads and the proper outlines you know you can't beat it depending on what you want to do with the wave you know but I like the way they go straight into a turn and come straight out of a turn. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do a lot in between turning or whatever. But Sunset it lends itself to that kind of thing. Let's go back a little bit. You show up in Hawaii at 19. You've already visualized how to surf it without ever actually surfing it, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How was your first session out there? It was kind of astro, man. It was kind of like... okay. Uh, I remember I had a heat with Dennis Pang, mm. Peter Townen, oh. Barton Lynch, okay. and Willie Morris. It was like macking Sunset Point as good as it gets coming off Boneyards. It wasn't out in the middle, but it wasn't small. Mm -hmm. It was real west. And I remember identifying these waves that nobody were the, – the waves were opening up and spitting on Boneyards – and then lining straight over into the bowl where everybody was taking off at Sunset Point. Wow. And I remember telling my friend, Shrimpo, who has since passed away because he was on the beach with me. And he was kind of my only friend, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Kirk Carlson. I said, look at that. Look at that. Look at those bomb tubes over there. <laughs> Nobody's over there. I said, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to take off behind that thing. And I'm going to go straight through it. And I remember, and he's like, whoa, like, like, <laughs> you know, that's because it was heavy, you know? Yeah. And I remember taking off on a wave, my first wave. And I, I went to the bottom and I'm like, I'm not over there. I'm here at the point with these guys. And I just went to the bottom and kicked straight out of a perfectly good wave. Mm -hmm. And I just paddled 20, 
30, I don't know, feet, yards, whatever, way back over there. Mm -hmm. And I took five waves back to back and I won the heat. Wow. And no one knew who I was. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. They were like, who the, what now? You know, who's this kid? So it was really a a thrill that I I could just see, okay, that's that. And I'm going to go get that. Yeah. And my stance and my surfing reflected more of like a Michael Peterson mixture of of somebody who's raised in point breaks, but mimics like mimicking more BK and Reno Abelero mixed with Michael Ho. There was all this mixture in my blood from Mm. studying those surf films. Then when it moved out in the middle, I won seven rounds and made a quarterfinal. Wow. And I remember uh, the locals, uh, they started getting nasty in the water. <laughs> and, okay. uh, and you know, a couple guys, I'm not going to mention, you know, they were like, what? You come on, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm um, like, okay, like, I just totally shut down. I was like, hey, bro, like, I got to live here. The, this is where I live now. Mm-hmm. M- mind you, I, I was like moving there. Yeah. I wasn't. You weren't, you weren't visiting. <laughs> No. Yeah. Okay. And I was there for life and uh, they just didn't know it yet. Okay. You know, but then the next season I did the same thing and made a semifinal, same thing. In the semifinal, I started getting grief, but it wasn't quite as bad. But I, I think I sort of like just got scared and nervous that it was the semis and I, Oh my gosh, I'm going to be in a final. I wasn't, used to being in a final or anything. I never surfed contests. In between these seasons, were you surfing Sunset a lot? Oh, yeah. All I, that's time? all I would do every okay. day. It, repetition is the mother of perfection. Like, you know, repeat, repeat, repeat. Get used to the poundings. Mm-hmm. Realize that, okay, the poundings aren't as bad as I imagined they would be. I was ready on the plane. I was on this gnarly fear trip. Like, I'm going to die in Hawaii. Like, I was like. Like, you had a plan. Kind of. I was, yeah, I was like, I was <laughs> psyched out. Like, I was like a little nut kid. Like, I, I didn't know anything, you know? And all I knew is that I had blue eyes and blonde hair and that I was to put my eyes down and don't look at anyone. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if somebody screams at you, you just walk the other way and put your head down humbly and you don't act. You don't say, what? What's wrong? You don't talk back nothing. How'd you learn that? Back then, it, that was fine. I, I, it was welcome. It was a welcome change. You know, like okay. I was kind of like, I thought it was kind of cool. Like I was taking one for the white man, like kind of thing, like, okay, cool. I'm a minority. This is, this is refreshing. Okay. And it made me more hungry. Okay. So, but I'm not clear on this. Was your first time surfing sunset in a heat or was it a free surf? Oh no. I surf sunset like three or four go outs. Oh, before I had, I had less than a week to prepare for the contest. So I just, I just had ridden a few waves Okay, and then I was thrown. But to be honest, right when I was in the heat, Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything. All I knew is I used to love the way the guys would uh, see with the way my brother and Alan used to film. They used to film them paddling up the face and then whipping it around under the hood, yep. you know, last minute kind of thing. And they didn't have to paddle very much. And my brother pointed out, look, they don't even have to scrap in. If you're trying to scrap in early, you're going to end up getting hung out to dry. You want to get up under that thing and get in late because you end up having more speed down the face. Wow. And so I just, I just did that repeatedly, repeatedly. I just kept doing these wheelie drops, you know, and then hitting the rail mid face and trying to mimic Barry Kanaipuni because the way to get good points at sunset is to hit a mid face turn back up the face, do a snap, then drop in. Okay. You know, you know yeah, that was yeah. over the last few days. I've watched some of the old footage from you, like on YouTube and stuff. And uh, there's really not any old footage. It's mostly from the nineties. Yeah. Okay. So from the nineties. So I guess there's yeah. a, there's a gap of 10 years probably, I guess. Right. That's, yeah, there you there didn't use that when I was doing it. There was no video. You were either in sixteen millimeter or mm-hmm. thirty five millimeter or nothing. Okay, do you have any of that footage of yourself? Well, yeah, like a little bit. Okay. Um, there, Scott Dietrich yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. had some film. Bill Delaney from Freeride had some footage. 
but uh, you know, it'd be nice to find here and there. I'd be able to see it, but I was never, I never rounded it up and yeah. kept it. If anybody hears this and they have old footage of Davy Miller, contact him. He wants to see it. <laughs> I want to see it too. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Right on. Let's go to the very beginning. How'd you get into surfing and where'd you grow up? I was born here in Ventura, California. Mm-hmm. I had an older brother named Donnie. He was the guy I spoke of that used to um, spend a lot of time. And actually, I have this other story about the, how he prepared the Moipano family for me because he became dear friends with them when mm-hmm. he was filming over there in the 70s. And I was born in 1960 when I was about six or seven i started going down to the beach because we lived right up at the top of california street okay and we lived on the road to the cross and we had a house that was all by itself my grandmother owned that house oh cool and the land all the way in this whole valley up on there wow and my mom was so poor that we got to live at grandma's estate wow (laughs) you know we got to live at this wonderful place that was like I mean, everybody thought it was like old school, Mm -hmm. but for me, it was just way better than any of the other nicer houses that were in like tracked homes and stuff that my aunties and stuff had. And I was just really blessed. And I I always could tell, you know, when to go to the, the beach and my brother, you know, taught me surfing and taught me how to surf without a leash would okay. not let me use it. Well, actually leashes weren't even evolved very much. We didn't use leashes. Yeah. I learned how to do a lot of ding repair because you know, there was rocks on the point and we so you're surfing point. C street. Yeah. And well, it's not actually, there's no such thing as C street. Okay. You've got uh Ventura point, which yeah. is what they call C street. Yeah. Uh, that's basically a surf line went in and renamed all the spots. The top up by the Ventura River mouth is named the pipe. That's called the pipe. It always has been. Okay. uh, Because there was used to be a pipe that ran out there that took all the water from the street water and dumped it there. Okay. Down on the inside, there was the smaller point, which is the point. And then down inside point was the bay down there. And the point used to be a lot bigger. So it was like kind of offshore wind down in there in the afternoons. Uh, Okay. And then you got the pier. And then you got the jetties yeah. that I won't mention and uh, <laughs> any, any more than that. You know, I, I was the youngest surf rat in town there. My brother would leave me alone and he would go surf the top and he would leave me down at Inside Point, which was another name for the spot was Pussy's Peak. <laughs> okay. And that was what the old guys called it because that's where all us little Grammys surfed, you know, all of the little it. kids. yeah. yeah. And I was actually the only kid my age. And then by the time other kids came my age to start surfing, I was already paddling up and out on bigger days, not giant days, but, you know, good sized swells with my brother trying to hang out with him and his old friends. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, beat it, Davey. Oh, Davey. Yeah. What are you doing out here, Davey? You know, I was like too little to be Mm -hmm. out there. I would uh, hold on to my board. After we'd wipe out and we'd go and jump and dive on our surfboard and hold on to it and just get beat to heck holding on to our surfboard so it wouldn't go in on the rocks. Yeah. And uh, we learned how to body surf, catch our boards before it hit the rocks. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, and ding repair. It kind of gave me a, a wide array of, of lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it lent itself to Hawaiian-style surfing. And from the time I was probably 11... I just desired to to be a, a Hawaiian surfer, and I admired the Hawaiian people more than they will ever know. Mm. Like, like I absolutely was not. Uh, well, see, it was partly because I was the only blonde, blue-eyed kid in my family. Okay. My older brother, he came from a Portuguese guy. Okay. So he had very dark hair and dark and dark eyes and dark complexion. Both my sisters, very mm-hmm. dark complexion. Mm-hmm. I was the only blonde, blue-eyed kid in my family. And I always felt, but they never said, oh, you're the half-brother or anything. It was like they totally took me under their wing. 
and the, there was a lot of love in the family, of course, but I was different. And and you felt that you were different? No. no okay. I, I knew that I wasn't. I knew that my blood was the same as yeah, theirs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I found out when I was getting ready to go to Hawaii, they're like, oh, bro, they're going to eat you up, man. You know, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you little Holly boy, little, you know, with the with the big blonde, you know, scarecrow, George Greeno haircut. Yeah. You know, like you're going to just get you're going to get donuts and all that. <laughs> and uh, and I never did. And it's because I treated them the way we preferred visitors to treat us when they came to Ventura. Mm, okay. Ventura was a little bit localized, but not in a way where, oh, you don't live here, don't surf here. But if you paddled out and you acted uh, dumb, then, you know, you got treated. Some of the lo- well, some of the locals were, they're just crazy. Oh, I bet. And it was weird too, because everybody thought because I was the guy that came from Ventura that I was like one of them. <laughs> but that's so, not really that wasn't really the case yeah, yeah yeah so you were surfing all the different breaks along california street and the point yeah over not so much california street mostly it was it was um you know i go down hideout silver strand um oh, Port really? Lagoo. oh so yeah we'd be surfing too. santa cruz santa rosa and san miguel hollister ranch Tarantulas, Point Conception, okay. Northern Cal. Um, we were all over the place. Chasing and Super well. Tubes. Oh, yeah. We, my brother, he had this Cortina. And in the summers, we would go south. And yeah. in the winters, we would go north. When wow. the big swells hit, we'd go up, surf Poison Oak Point. You know, all the secret spots above Santa Barbara there. There's a few that, um, you know, don't break much anymore. And... Why were you leaving Ventura? Because Ventura would be really good too, probably. Well, the thing is, is we would surf early morning when it was howling offshore uh, yes. in Ventura. But we wait all year for these big swells. Yeah. And then all these guys jump on the freeway and go up and surf waves half the size at Rincon and Pitus. We wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. We would surf the mornings. But no, we would surf. The top of the point used to be a lot like Jay Bay. Wow. I went and surfed Jay Bay as good as it, as it got. And, of course, it's better than the pipe. The pipe is similar to Jay Bay in texture and the direction, the way the waves appear mm-hmm. in a photograph. Like the way they they feel when you're flying over the, the offshore chops and when it's real cold and offshore. Mm-hmm. It's like Jay Bay, except for it just doesn't have that tube that goes to impossibles there. But sometimes when the sand's good, there's a whole other thing that happens up there and it tubes up by hobo jungle, like just North uh, Ventura uh, river mouth there just this season, December 28th, it was my birthday and I was surfing, you know, with only about 10 guys in the water and, you know, it was a real high tide optimum conditions for big swell high tide. So the waves were like not just breaking way outside and mushing out. It was like coming in and the wind was holding it up. Yeah. And uh, Mike Parsons was out. It was pretty cool. Cool. I was like 63 just uh, going at it. So, yeah, I think I saw some of that footage made like the L.A. News and stuff and it showed you surfing. Oh, yeah. I didn't know about that. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No. Yeah. I saw you on there. It was kind of cool. Going back to Ventura as a kid, what was the Ventura vibe like? You kind of touched on it, but like, if you weren't a local, do you guys demand respect being a local? Well, you know, it's more intricate than that. Okay. You know, we're all a bunch of sweethearts. You I'm know, sure. like, like, you know, like there, there was a guy named Leslie Wong mm-hmm. and he was one of the best surfers in the world, bar none. He was half Hawaiian, half Chinese. Mm-hmm. He was from Makaha mm-hmm. and him and Ryan, his friend and George, uh, Ryan was a painter, George mm-hmm. was a glasser, and Leslie was a shaper. Wow. Now, Leslie, like, I think won some contests a long time ago, like in the late 60s uh, or 1971 or something, like the World Something Contest or whatever. Mm-hmm. He was like, he surfed like Barry Kanaipuni. You know that James Brown song, like, Daddy Don't Take No Mess? Yeah, I know the song. 
Yeah, daddy don't t- take no mess. You know, if we did wrong, <laughs> he beat the hell out of us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Leslie was kind of like that. Okay. And so he put Ventura, he really helped perpetuate that violent aspect of localism. And we were, as locals, were like, whoa, man, that's gay, brah, you know, <laughs> wow. You know, like, hey, you know, brah, don't, don't kill the guy, you know, let him go, you know. Right. And I loved Leslie, but I never liked that part. But he had a, a fiery temper. And then there was other locals who were like these surfers, but they were actually just these gnarly Hells Angel guys. Wow, that's surfed. And, you know, and there was, I have... You know, I knew George, the president of the Hells Angels, just because I was from Ventura and they had the Ventura chapter. And, the, you know, I saw those guys down there all the time. And, you know, I, I guess it just looked scary. I never saw anything happening or anything. But I do know that from what I heard before I was on the scene, when I was just little, still surfing down at the pier and yeah. down at Inside Point, that those guys were like ruling up on the top there with a iron fist, you know, or whatever. I, I don't know myself firsthand. I probably shouldn't even mention it, but I, I just, Ventura always had that backwards kind of rough. localism. You know, there was a lot of ignorance, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, the, in their minds, they were protecting, you know, I get it. The surf, like they'd see people with cameras and they would, they'd say, w- what are you doing with that camera? And people like, oh, we're filming for the something news. And they're like, bro, they would just break the camera and throw it in the ocean. Wow. Different yeah, time. Like different time. Yeah. Just just, you know, and now there's cell phones. You can't none of that stuff is possible now. Right. Um, not that I think it's good, but I but I have to admit there was more order in the lineup and yes. that was, the lineup was safer. Yes. And people we see I was born and raised here right. and I could not go to the top of the point and surf until I learned how to surf. Yes. And we had to learn how to surf to where we're pretty good. Right. As it should before be. Before we could even paddle up there. In my belief. And we got in trouble if, and, and we were from there. Right. You know, if we were kids and we were trying to go up there before our time. So I think there was aspects of it that was functional. Yeah, but 100%. not the I agree violent stuff. That's that's just dumb, and right. it's gross, and it's it's miserable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that, but I think back in those days, that's before my time, really. But yeah. th- it was there was a reason why things happened, and it's different today. So we'll, we'll just move on. Yeah, back. and and I and when I came back, and I, like I don't want to touch on too much negativity, like right. we talked of, yeah. about before. No, this is just history. Uh, when I this first came back from Hawaii, like see, I had heard that they had paved a parking lot and put the walkway all the way up. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. to the Ventura River mouth. Yeah, and so when I came home, all my friends were like, "Davy, man, you got to help us clean this place up. It's just gone to wreck." And I'm like. Well, what are you guys doing? You know, like, why are you asking me? You know, like, <laughs> I'm like 40. I was like 40 years old, you know? Yeah. And if I went up there and then some guys were like, you know, um, I don't know you. Who are you? You know, I never seen you before. You know, I've been here 15, 20 years, you know? Right. And I was like, yeah, I've been gone that, that amount of time. And, it, and then they would, like, be rude to me. And then I would, like... You know, I'm a passionate person, you know, I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not perfect. And I would like maybe yell at him or something. And then from a distance, people like see me yelling at him and they're like, oh, Davey Miller, he thinks he's, oh, he must think he's some big shot pro surfer, like egomaniac or something. Mm-hmm. But y- they don't see what had happened mm-hmm. d- to make that happen. Just like a lot of people show videos of police doing bad stuff. And we know the police do bad stuff. We know that that's that, you know, yeah, but, but we don't know that all the scenarios, you know, what you don't see what happened the camera before that pushed play. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I just, that's all I have to say on all that. Yeah. Were there a lot of surfers in high school and junior high as you're growing up? Oh Did you yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of great cats, man. I mean, all my best friends, you know, uh, that was, uh, Ronnie wheat, 
Chris Quam, you know, Mike Phelps. There was the older guy, Paul Allery, who was kind of like surf like Bertleman. And there was older guys like Guy Ritter and Greg Sales, uh, mm -hmm. powerhouse surfer guys. You know, there was a guy named Russell Wyman who passed away, who ripped, you know. And But mostly my main influence was Leslie Wong. And all the names, like, I I mean, I didn't mention, like, 20 or 30 of my of course. really good yeah, friends. Can, yeah. I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to sit and ramble off yeah, all these yeah. no, names. No, no. It's just all my good buddies, you know. I mean, right. sure. And when I left here, and I didn't come back for 20 years straight, the truth is, I never really grew up when I was here in, in Ventura. Got it. Yeah, I understand you, you know, I mean, I was 19 when I left. You're you know how still a kid. you don't really grow up in high school. You right. grow up. Not even in college. It's almost like after college. Mm -hmm. Those are the friends that you end up having for the rest of your life. And one heartbreaker for me is a lot of my dearest friends, the people that I knew when I was, you know, when I had my head screwed on straight. <laughs> you yeah. know, my dear friends, like my friend Charlie Walker. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, I miss Charlie. You know, I miss my friends on the North shore, you yeah. know, like yeah. good people, you know, Jack Reeves, the glass or Ed Surfoss, the guy the, from country surfboards and, and so many people, I mean, and some of my friends that seem like they, my best friends would die like Marvin Foster and oh, yeah. Ronnie Burns, you know, the guys who were real sweet to me, Mark who, you know, I, yeah. I, I was renting from him when he passed and oh. it breaks my heart that I had to leave Hawaii, but I didn't want my children to go to school there. Okay. because they were little blue-eyed, blonde-haired, toe-head girls. Mm. And I just did not want them to come home one day crying because they got called a howly. Because that's when I knew I would end up in trouble. I would either end up dead or in jail or maybe not as bad, but definitely I would get into some hassles that From I that I saw. your family. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, call me a, a effing howly 5,000 times and I'd be like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry what the, what the white guys did to you, you guys, but bro, I'm not the one that took your Island, you know? Yeah. And it used to kind of trip me out cause you can be any denomination of person with dark hair, dark eyes. It doesn't matter what country and you're local, but if you have blue eyes and blonde hair, you're the devil that stole their island. Mm. And they really like to vent on blue eyes and blonde hair. And I was okay with it. But, man, you do it to my daughters, Brian. I'm, yeah. You know. It's just, a different story. Yeah. For sure. I get that. That's why I moved, you know. Yeah. And people are like, oh, I heard you got kicked off the island. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I guess I had some enemies, too. Like, you know, people that would want to say something like that just to demean me or something, you know, yeah. for whatever reason. There's a lot of egos and there's a lot – there is a lot of – you know, I was truly blessed by my Heavenly Father mm -hmm. with the talent of painting. You know, I was able to stay living beachfront pipeline. Wow. Long after I wasn't a pro surfer technically, I made a final on a board I built – in 12 foot Hawaiian pipe with Andy Irons and Derek Ho. Mm -hmm. You know, I made this on a board that I made and the paintings that I would sell, you know, I was making a living. I didn't need anybody. I was self-employed and I was making way more money than I ever made uh, as a surfer. Being an artist being an artist that's and so right that's there was awesome. a lot of things that, you know people were there's the lovers there's the people that are happy for people and then there's the people that are not happy for people mm -hmm. and, the, and it's just they're always there in, okay. in everyone's life not just mine i don't feel like i'm special or picked on or anything no 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 let's get back onto that so you you have this time in ventura any of the kids surfing contests at your school? No, no. Anti you know, contest was environment. Kind of like, yeah, yeah. Pretty much anti contest. Like, like the thing with the skateboarding. Like, yeah. We were on the Sims team back when we we're. I was like 14, 15, 16, yeah, 17. Yeah, I read that. I was equal. To be honest, I was equal with Tony and Jay until they started flying out of the pool. Oh, gotcha. Um, 
my left arm was broken three times because when I was six, I went through a glass door. Oh, shit. It cut the ulnar nerve. And they had to remove the muscle in my arm. That was when I was six. My left arm was severely weakened. Mm -hmm. And I had to just quit skating. But we used to go down and we'd skate. And the cameras, I had some footage and free ride of me filming. They filmed me going around the pool, around and really? around. Really? Interesting. Yeah. Cool. And um, and But the thing is, is that that was because Bill was my friend from Ventura. Okay. And I told him, come down in the pool and, and follow me and I'll go around you. But when the cameras would come to the pools, Jay and them would go right to the camera and do a snap. And we would go to the opposite end, and they'd, they'd come over to film us over there, and we would go to the opposite end. It was very self-defeating. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah. So, it was silly. I mean, we thought, oh, it's just, you know, we need to not do it for that reason. Okay. And I was addicted to Pipeline, and then it just ends up being Kodak Reef. All these guys are, you know, you're passing these guys in the tube. And oh, well, hold on. Let's 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 hold off on pipe. Ventura's okay. anti contest. You move to Hawaii. You know, you jump in on the sunset contest. You're surfing sunset all the time, as we talked about earlier. When do you realize that pipe's a good wave, or, or what? What drove oh, you to want to surf well, pipe? No, right, pretty much right out of the gate. But I was advised to get set to work harder at sunset. You see, Sunset Beach. You have to be way more fit. Oh yeah, to, I, yeah, I see to that. To engage in the entire way, to stay out in the water and ride the whole wave at Sunset Beach and get five, ten, eight waves, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be takes a lot more strength. Pipeline is way easier to ride than Sunset. You okay. know, it's more like a of a mind thing. It's like you. You know, you when you're surfing pipeline, you have to just treat it like a big beach break. You cannot think about that reef. Just think about getting in early mm -hmm. enough to where you're in command to whatever's going on. So you can stall into one or you can you can hit that turn early and pump another turn and backdoor it. Whichever way you're approaching each individual wave, you just make sure you make the drop at pipe. Okay. And, and you can tell if you're going to make a drop or not as you're paddling. Okay. You know, yes, mostly. I knew how to take off late at pipe. I just had a natural knack at pipe because of Point Magoo. See, Point Magoo comes out of very deep water. Mm -hmm. And you can't see it. It's harder to ride than pipeline. When it's big, when we're talking about like 12-foot Hawaiian mm -hmm. Magoo, you don't see it coming. You have to like, you barely get a hint of it. Oh, there it is. And you spot it. And you got to paddle over under this thing. And... You just learn how to eat it, and you learn how to make in, in just insanely late drops. Whereas pipeline, you see the wave hit the reef out there, and it drags, and then it comes over, and then it jacks. You can identify the wave. Okay. Makes sense. But sunset, I did work on sunset more Okay. at first, and then I ended up just being a strictly pipe surfer towards the end. I actually gave up sunset in the last few years because I knew I was going to be leaving as soon as my children were going to be getting ready to go into uh, kindergarten. Oh, okay. Because I knew at that point that I just wanted pipeline. And I do have a story about something that happened at back door after I had already shipped everything. It was kind of incredible. You want to tell it right now? Okay. So, um, so I used to go down and sit because I lived right there at Pipe. So when I lived in off the wall, I would sit out on the wall and watch it on big days. Mm -hmm. And I used to always try and identify waves on big days during lulls. Uh, there's a group of surfers that would, when I was doing it, it was Mike Stewart, Sean Briley, a couple other guys I didn't know their names, and myself. Mm-hmm. And, the, and there was never pro surfers out. It was when people were surfing Waimea and we were out scrambling around over into the channel. Uh, you could see the waves coming. You know, you've been to Pipeline, right? I've been there, but yeah. 
Yeah, well, well, pipeline, you'll see the waves coming and you can see these sets coming um, literally a mile away, yeah. way out on the reef. Mm-hmm. And you see them coming and you're like, what can, I, what, what can I scoop up? Okay, time's running out. And you'd have a time. So you'd paddle over into the channel and you paddle over there and there's a place where you can hide out. Okay. And sometimes you just these big swells with four feet of white water on the top. Mm. And you're punching through that last top part. It's, it's pretty scary. Yeah. But if you're used to it and you understand it, it's really a wonderful experience because there's no one else out at pipe. And then what will happen is there will be these lulls and you paddle back over and you score these waves in between the sets. Okay. One time there was a brand new swell with a 20 second. Wow. Interval. Yeah. Long period. And so when those swells would first hit, pipeline was dredging all the water off the reef at pipe. Mm. And it was super scary. And those are the kind of days where even Mike Stewart was like backing out mm. of waves. There were certain waves you just could not paddle into. It was like it was breaking like Kyopu or however you pronounce that wave. Yes. And like bigger Kyopu, like where you can't paddle into them. When I had watched Pipeline, I'd noticed that every so often there was a right where there was enough north. And if you got just the right one, Mm -hmm. that I would mind surf a wave that started out at gums. And and, and in fact, all the way over to the right, not even on the reef yet at Pipeline, is the only place that you could even possibly think about taking off on one of those rights. Mm -hmm. And to think about going right on one of those waves was what I always wanted to do, but I never really saw one for even from the beach. I'd see him and I'd see him come in. Oh, that one's the one it's going to do it. And I was so excited, even though I was like just watching from the beach and then it would kind of wobble or, or it would open up and then clamp or something. You'd just be, you'd just be dead. You know, it would look like really horrible, you know, like frightening kind of thing. Well, I was surfing in this late afternoon, and I had already sent all my stuff home. And I had been sort of praying and visualizing. And all the waves that I had ridden over those two decades Mm -hmm. at Pipeline, at Backdoor, and I had ridden some bigger waves at Backdoor. Yeah. I knew there was a wave that I hadn't gotten yet. And I rode a wave that I had never seen one like it on film. I had never seen one like it sitting from the beach. I was sitting, we were riding waves and out of nowhere, cause it was just West, West, all left. And then all of a sudden, one of those weird North sets came, you know, where everybody has to wait for it to pass and it's a big mess and it, you have to wait for all that mess to go away. Well, I was like, okay, so there's North. And then my antennas just started going ding, 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 ding. (laughs) There could be a big, heavy right. I knew that there could be, and I had this faith, this hope of this big, late evening, dead glass that was like hardly any offshore. It was just a touch of offshore. Perfect. But you'd look over there at back door, and it was just like gas coming out the back of the waves, closing out. It was just total gnarlesome over there. Like, like death do you part. If you just looking over there made you feel like it would just kill you. Okay. And I was in the lineup and I started paddling. If you've been surfing a really, really long time at Piper at any spot, you'll look at the lineup and go, Oh shit. In three waves, there could be this one big thing. Right. Okay. Okay. I started paddling out Okay. 45 degree angle out and into the channel. There was this kid there and he's always on the shoulder. Actually, I'm not going to mention his name because he's always on the shoulder at, at pipe. And, and I paddled right by the guy mm-hmm. okay. and he's like, where are you going? Like, cause you know, the, the wave in front of it hadn't even come to the reef yet. Okay. So I had another 20 seconds. I paddled over that wave and I was already in the channel at gums <laughs> and the whole crowd started yelling, Go, Mila, Mila, you poop. Yelling at me to go on this thing. 
And I swear I had so little time to get over to where I knew I had to be. Right. Okay. So anyway, right. so I'm paddling over there okay. and these guys wanted to see me dead. Let's face it. Okay. They were <laughs> sick of it because I was like a wave magnet at that door and people hated me over there. <laughs> it's just, it's just the truth, bro. Okay. I mean, like, Pipe surfers, they're not happy. Like, I've heard them talk. Oh, like, they're talking to the guy. Oh, yeah, it was so fun. And then all of a sudden, one of them gets a barrel of back door, and it's the best one of the afternoon, and the other guys are like, and that's like <laughs> their friend. No, yeah. they're like, and I'm thinking, shit, if they say that about their friend, what are they saying about me, right? Right. Anyway, it's like, it's a very selfish sport out there at Pipes. Everybody acts like they're so stoked for you. And I would always go, oh, bro, that was sick. And I would always try and let people know that I'm genuinely stoked for them. Yeah. If they get a good wave. Right. And they look at me like, they, they don't believe me. They're like, you're, you know, you're not being honest. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, seriously, bro. <laughs> anyway, so I paddled out, way out there. And there was a wave. And it was a north platform. I whipped it around on an eight- uh, the board was eight, nine. Wow. I had board. gone in and got my biggest pipe gun, baby swallowtail, bonds or five fin, right? Yeah. I paddled as hard as I could. And just, just so you know, when I was paddling the opposite direction to go into the channel, I took one quick glance. Mm -hmm. I took a quick glance at what I was going to paddle to get to. Okay. I know. I mean, over my shoulder to look at what that wave was going to be doing. Yes. It bowled out to this giant shoehorn bowl, took a turn, and I saw three corners, corner, and each corner got smaller into a, a shoulder over by off the wall. It was the extremest, most insane thing I've ever seen. It reflected in the sparkling light. Wow. It, it seemed like it, made, it blinded me because the, the sparkle just went sap and it said, pay attention, get back to it. I paddled straight over there. I whipped it around straight to the beach without even looking if I was too deep or anything. And I was way over in gums. Okay. I paddled down the face. I stood up and started jamming down the face. I got right to the bottom of the wave. The tail suddenly just went up behind me. What? The tail of the board stood vertical up and the nose went in the water. What? Like the nose was not underwater. It was in the water. Oh, no. And I had that straight entry rocker, right? Mm -hmm. And I stood on that tail as hard as I could. And the board went, I just barely got that thing to stay out of the water. And I went flying 10 feet out in front of the wave. And I was going so fast. Oh, I, bet. I was going so fast, but I was going straight towards the beach and I wasn't even on the reef. I was in the channel. Wow. Gump. I hit a bottom turn. I call them a boiling turn where I, I bury the rail and I lift the board out of the face to bring it back, to bring the board up okay. onto the wave. And then I hit another turn to go up and I tried not to look at where I was going. Cause at that point I knew that there was no getting out of this. Okay. But I went up out. I surfed out to the bowl and it threw out wow. 30 feet. Wow. I'm not exaggerating how far it, it pitched. Oh, I believe you. It pitched so far that the wave pitched up at a 45 degree angle and heaved out and I had no choice but to stay on my surfboard. I was scared to death. I just wanted, <laughs> I wanted out of there and I hit a turn so hard. That was my third turn and I was high enough. I hit a turn and that explosion came under my board, but my big gun just cut through like butter and and then it gained speed because bonzers gain speed in a straight line. You don't have to pump, especially if there's a trough. It just, and then right then it vacuumed back like they talk about. And then it blew in there so hard that I couldn't see anything for a good, like, Four seconds. Wow. And he said the tube was just getting started. And then it, it, it cleared. It cleared. And I hit another turn. And I thought, okay, 
okay, please let me just see I, the whole tube. I thought I was just going to get a little bit further, mm -hmm. just a little bit further. Okay. So I made it past that. Then it blew again, seemingly even harder. Wow. I was way back in the tunnel. I was so far back, but it blew the boards kind of sideways and broke the fins free and blew. And then my the rail reconnected and the way the water rushing up the face and the way my board hit, I got extra speed into a turn right when it reconnected. And that thing finally blew free and I was flying as wow. fast as I've ever gone on a surfboard. 20 feet back from where the lip was cracking and peeling, trying to get ahead of me. I hit another turn and then it turned a corner and crazy. blew a third time. I started flying. And I, at that point I was, uh, I seemed like I was deeper than I had been the whole time. And this is, it seemed like the wave took as long as this part of the story is taking. <laughs> and then, and then listen, bro, I'm serious. The thing spit a fourth time what? and I came that the wave turned again and shrunk and I realized I was coming out wow. and I came flying out of the tube, right? Yeah. You know that rock okay. that's right on the inside of the very end of ain't. There's, a, there's that channel that separates off the wall and back door. And if you get just the right one, it turns into that gnarly, shallow funnel, and there was no disturbances. There was no sections. There was no choppy, wobbly nothing. I came flying out at a 45-degree angle straight at the rock towards the beach, and the wave was shoulder high. Wow. And I jumped off the board, and the water was trying to suck me back out, and I scrambled to get back. And I got back and over the whitewater and, and went over the whitewater. No one over at the pipe house saw it that I know of, but Davy Cantrell saw it. Davy Cantrell is that really great goofy footer who surfed in Pipe Masters contest. He was an amazing goofy footer at Rocky, mostly always surfing Rocky Point. Yeah, Davy Cantrell and Kevin, my neighbor who lived right next to the wall, the house on the wall at Off the Wall. And this guy, Kevin, owned that house for a long time. And that was the wave of my life. And, brother, I knew in my heart that my Heavenly Father had gotten me through that wave. And not only that, but he gave me that wave. And every wave I had ever ridden before it didn't feel anything like that wave. No, and the I sun, you. the sun was glistening through. Meantime, all that shit was happening it was a sunset in the tube with that lime golden God looking light coming through. And the water was so shallow at the base that you could literally see the reef rushing by. It honestly looked like it was a foot deep towards the end of that wave. It was like one foot deep. And it finally, and I knew it was only a couple feet deep because right when I came out, the whole reef came out of the water. Wow. The water fell off. And I had to get on the whitewater and pull the board back and float over the top. It was the wave of my life at that back door. Insane. And it wasn't just back door. It was the entire length of the reef at Pipeline. Oh, stretch. And as, God, as God is my witness, bro. That's insane. As God is my witness. The guys, I asked them what it looked like. They were sitting behind the wave. Mm-hmm. They saw the rooftop mm -hmm. all the way down to where it was exploding. They were behind the wave. There was no back. Wow. They, it, was, it was all back. It was like a Tiopu wave. Insane. It, it was the most frightening thing that ever happened to me, man. But yet the most beautiful. It was so beautiful. And I almost just, I don't know, like I think it might have been a blessing that no one got that on film. Because you know what? I swear to you, that's all I have to say. I, I you know, there's things, that's you just, there's, that's there's certain story. levels, there's certain things like everybody wants. Was that, that. Hawaii saying goodbye to you? It, it was my heavenly father saying, good job. You made the right choice. You're putting your family first. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. 
Wow, that's an amazing story. Yeah, and you're a great storyteller. That's but that's frightening. Uh, I, have it's a, frightening. I have a story like that for YMA, and I have one that happened to me on a wave at Sunset Beach where the main outside peak was a reformed double up like Velsyland. Mm. And it was slow motion, 15 foot. And it was the only day I've ever seen it hold that big. And it was a variable winds, dead glass and a giant cathedral tube that I was so frightened in. I was only 24 years old when that one happened. It happened on a seven, six, and that fin was so thick and it got glassed in that year. Mm-hmm. Accidentally, it got glassed in an inch and a half further back than it was supposed to. Oh. And the guy was all bummed. My shaper was super mad at the glassers. Yeah. But that's when I got like the wave of my life at the point on a big left at pipe and that fin held in. And at sunset, when it boxed out in front of me and I had to go to the bottom of the wave and do a bottom turn on that last part of the inside section at sunset in a tube that you could have put two buses through. Uh, Yeah, I bet. I've never seen a tube that big and round at sunset ever before or, and I never saw it break like that after it was a ridiculous, there was five guys out. There was two guys surfing second and third reef Bradshaw and Adam 12 were surfing the outer reef. And Michael Ho was surfing the tail ender section on the inside section at sunset Mm -hmm. because it was so good, but it was just too big for sunset. And Charlie Walker and I paddled out there and we saw one hit the middle and just tube and never even burble or gurgle or do anything weird. You know, sunset opens and then clamps and then opens back up. And we saw this wave. And as I said, I'm going to go get one of those. And he just yelled at me, be careful. As I was paddling and I went over there, I went over there by myself and got that wave. This is the cocky part. I was all fired up. You know how you get one of those barrels? Okay. You're like pumped up. It, the channel, the channel closed out. I had to do a snap in the tomb and come out of a doggy door. Oh. Okay. And I came right past Michael Ho. And I was so thankful that he saw the wave of my life at the time. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was so like, wow, Michael oh, saw that wave. I can't believe it. Stoked. He saw the whole thing, man. It, it was like, wow. Like it was just, it was beyond, it was next level for, for me anyway. I yeah. mean, I'd never, I never saw one like that on film. I, it was just ridiculous. And so I tried to paddle back out and do it again. And I pulled in and I hit an air pocket. Mm. And ate shit and went over the falls in slow motion. (laughs) And it pounded me so viciously that if I wasn't that young and that prepared for that wipeout, I would have died. Oh, yeah. That's so scary. It beat the living hell out of me. And I guess my board was tombstoning. Oh, no. I was under the water for close to two minutes. What? Yeah. That's crazy. And, when, and, and bro, when I came up. Yeah. Because I was underwater pretending I was in a hammock. And visualizing I was like having a cocktail in a hammock somewhere. And I was just totally withdrawn from reality. Yeah, I can't even relate. And, I'll be honest. Listen, if anybody, if that happened to anybody and they panicked at all, they would have died. Yeah, and 100% it was I would just have been ridiculous. Dead. I think it was, it couldn't have been two minutes, but it was like over a minute. Bradshaw told me. Bradshaw and Charlie Walker were both paddling in at 45 degree angles to come to, to get the tombstone board and pull me up out of there. They thought I was dead. Yeah. Wow. And, and I came up and I went in. I was so stoked on the wave I got. I wasn't even thinking about the wipeout. I went in. I'm such a stupid little surf rat. I went up and I saw a rusty price door. I'm like, did you see the barrel? I got it was a wave of my life. He's like, no, but I saw you eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was just really funny because here I was, you know, I just had the wipeout of my life, but I, I just, I just wasn't affected by it. You know, it was just. What does that say about you at the time? You were just um, a stoked well, you know, surfing? like I, I have to tell you, man, when I was a little kid, yeah. Um, when I was real little, mm-hmm. my mom, we didn't have a dad. I didn't have a dad, you know? Okay. And um, there was no dad around. And my mom had to go to uh, 
work for 12 hour days. And she left me with my oldest sister who was six. And I was two. Wow. And I was like, shit in my, I was shitting my pants and everything. I had all these sores all over me, man. I was just a mess. Yeah. And they used to put me because she wanted to just play with Linda and Donnie because they were from one dad. And I was like this new little baby. Okay. And I was like super OC, you know, just X, Y, Z, just like hyperactivity and all this. Mm-hmm. They would um, tell me there were monsters in this closet and this dark room that my mom lived in where none of the sun, the mountain blocked all the morning sun. And it was on the side of the house that didn't get any sun from the rest of the day. Mm. So it was this dank you know, room. Yeah. And she would get me all freaked out and, and get me all like, because she was mad. Yeah. And, you know, because she was only six. She was yeah, innocent. And she was, like, you know? watching you. Yeah, and I get so it. She, she barricaded me in that closet. Wow. And left me in there for eight hours at a time. Oh. And she told me that, see, I never remembered this. But all I remember is being when I was 15, 14, 15, I was so scared of that room. I didn't know why I didn't feel comfortable in that room. Mm. Later, she told me when I was, like, married and I was, like, you know, 35 or something. And I said, Laura no, it's fine. You were just a kid. I said, but you know what? You created me. I said, thank you. You created me. When I was eight, this guy who adopted me and gave me the name Miller, Mm -hmm. he used to beat the shit out of me really bad. Like brutally, like, well, no, no, I, I'm not alone. I'm not special. That's happened to a lot of people. So anyway, he would take me out to this woodshed and he'd take my pants down. He took a wire brush and he would, he would beat me as hard as he could physically. I remember him hitting me as hard as he could with the back of this, you know, he hit me on the wood with the wood side, of course. Yeah. But he would, he would hit me until my ass was numb and he was still beating my numb butt. So see, I, I have PTSD. See, people think they know me. They don't fucking know me, bro. You know what I'm saying, bro? Yeah. Yeah. They don't know me. You know what I mean? I'm not some tough guy. I'm not some gangster, but I've been through hell. And you know what? That hell prepared me for that. I was comfortable in giant surf. Wow. Yeah. No, I see. And I was, and I was fully, you know, like, and I never kissed the ring like with Bradshaw. And so I wasn't invited to the Eddie. And I, you know, I kind of should have been like easily should have been, but, mm-hmm. but, I I actually, I always thought it was kind of weird, like, because they would go and stand on the beach and kind of like fold their arms and puff up their chest and put flowers on them and take photographs with their big wave guns. And I always thought it was a little embarrassing. Like I was like, I'm not, I wasn't jealous of it. I really was embarrassed. Like I didn't want to do that. See, I got invited to some of those ceremonies and I was like, I shied away from it because I didn't feel like I belonged because I didn't know Eddie. I don't think Eddie would have even liked me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you never know. Well, I'm just saying, he probably, well, he may have. Yeah, but he I'm may just, have. I'm not say, you know, I'm just saying, you know, he was a local Hawaiian man, you know, and I was like as white as they get. So I don't know, whatever. Yeah. But anyway, I just, I'm so thankful for the things that happened to me in my life that gave me that feeling of feeling comfortable getting pounded by Big Sur. How many covers have you made of the magazines? Do you know? Well, seven, if you include all the covers from all the countries. I had two on surfing, one on surfer, two on surfing life, one on a Brazilian magazine, one okay. on a Jap- one or two on a Japanese mag. Wow. But those kind of don't count. I mean, they're smaller mags, but they still kind of well, count. Well, I shouldn't say I shouldn't say they don't count. Yeah. I, I I don't know. Whatever, you know, I I had long arms, a swimmer's body, and zero caution. And I used to reflect of how safe I felt. And I watched people that had shorter arms and that were on hot shot little pintail narrow gunny little boards. 
yeah. that didn't have the foam that they should have. And I saw them paddling towards waves that I could tell they really didn't want. Mm. And then the last minute they would try and pound into it and I'd go, oh shit, dude. And they would just eat shit. And it was like, I remember realizing that I really felt safer because I wasn't, I would either back out really early mm -hmm. or not at all. And, and I was like all in. The longing for the big waves, did it help being in warm water? Also, leaving Ventura was kind of chilly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, man. In fact, like people are like, oh, dude, you know, you want to go surf Mavericks? And I'm like, no. It's cold. <laughs> it's cold, man. I don't want to. Why would I want to go surf that? I surfed Makaha mm -hmm. on the biggest day in like 15 years. Okay. I surfed two hours alone yeah i surfed alone in bathtub water dead glass 30 plus hawaiian and i was on a board that was way thicker and it was super it was glassed really light and it was a thruster pintail and it was built by uh, the great white what's that guy's name um uh, oh his name was mike Cruteau. And I remember showing up at nine in the morning and I looked at it and it looked like Rencon at, at like a perfect day at Rencon, like say dead glass, perfectly sunny, zero wind and just peeling right. But then I'd look and the channel was nearly closing out into Klaus Myers. And, and he's like, oh, dude, it's you. Sh you can't ride your nine six pintail brewer. You got to use my. 10 o that's built for for him and he was thicker much it was thicker and it was a boat i had the session of my life at makaha that was the best big waves experience of my life i rode about 15 waves wow. alone and i was so careful i knew that i that any of these waves if i made a mistake could kill me you know it started to drop a little and the wind was coming up and mm. then a few few other guys came out and I went in and that was the best session of my life in Big Surf. Why would I go surf freezing cold water for a photo op? You know, it's just not. All these stories I'm hearing from you. I have one question, though. Is there or was there any fear at all? I hear stoke. You're stoked on the waves, even though they're they could kill you. I'm going to tell you the 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 the, the scare the most scared I've ever been uh -huh. ever was Sunset Beach. Oh, I believe it. On a big west. I totally believe it. Big West Sunset Beach. I have nearly drowned. That water has taken me down, and I knew for a fact that the lifeguards didn't have any intention of coming over there. <laughs> The lifeguards do not patrol Sunset Beach. They're all down at Pipeline watching to see if somebody smashes on the reef. No one's worried about somebody drowning at Sunset. That big, when I got sucked over the falls, I had a lot of faith in that big lung full of air that I took because I was so scared, but I hadn't gotten rattled yet. Mm -hmm. And that's something I never did was I never took, I never got rattled and then stayed in the water. That you do not do. Okay. You don't surf Waimea till you're tired. There's certain rules you just obey. Yeah. Well, that makes you know? sense. And at, at Pipeline, if you get rattled, paddle right back out. It ain't going to drown you. Sunset, if you run into a situation where you used a lot of energy, mm -hmm. don't go back out, bro. Okay. Go home and go to sleep. Unless you're just dumb. Yeah. But I've almost drowned a number of times and been and literally crying for my heavenly father, like crying to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been f afraid. Okay. But somehow when it's real big, like I used to surf out there at the outside Himalayas. Wow. Um, yeah. And I used to surf it alone. Oh, well, I shouldn't say alone. There was like be one or two other people in the water, but they caught a wave and the other guy catch a wave. You're alone. Of you catch a wave and you're straightening off on the inside. You're alone. There ain't no one around. And there was no like jet skis to come and get you. None of that kind of stuff. But I was so careful and I surfed it with so much respect. And I would say reverence. Okay. You need to go with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, kind of the same way you would approach, you know, God. 
Okay. Like, you know, that makes like, sense. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you, your pride, you can't use your pride in the water, but see, I never really enjoyed the bigger surf as much as just like really good, clean surf. Yeah. Like I love Belzy land as good as it gets. It's not the size of the wave. It's the quality, you know? Okay. That's for me. All these contests you surfed, did you surf them just to have a few guys out in the water, right? You weren't chasing to be world champ or anything? Oh, no. You know, it's weird, too. Yeah. I always just visualized making the finals. Okay. I never visualized winning a contest. Interesting. I yeah, just interesting. wanted to make it through as many heats as I could. Okay. And I just wanted more hours. I wanted more waves. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And, more waves, and, and less the guys. Is, I, I never, you know, like I beat Slater in a quarterfinal at Sunset and made a final with my hero, Michael Ho. Heck, that's only got to happen to me one time to get yeah. me pretty happy and satisfied. That's like, I'm super not, satisfying. I'm not, I never was chasing after a world title, first of all, because... I didn't want to conform my surfing and change it to fit contest formats. Like look at Jack Robinson, his original style was so avant-garde and, and you you see like Jake Marshall, he still has that kind of avant-garde style. He hasn't allowed surf contests to mess with that. Some of these Aussies, you know, they have that, just that, that sheer brilliance and that style. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jack Robinson, you know, he wants to be a world title holder. And he has, and he has so a good he, chance. So, oh, yeah. He's always been, like, one of my very most favorite modern surfers of this day and age. But his surfing has changed. He's widened his stance, got a little more of a butt jacky style than okay. he used to. Okay. But it's okay because that's what he wants. You fair, know, fair. and it's not, it's not, a, I don't mean to insult him. He's freaking, you know, no, 10 exactly. times the surfer I ever was. I'm he's just a saying, great server. I'm just, yeah, he's an incredible, but he, I'm really like sensitive to style and stuff, you know, like I really like, um, I like the way style and surfing in the seventies was more than I like it now. Like, you know, MR and rabbit Bartholomew and Barry Kanapuni, Lopez, that's what I like to see. That's how I want to feel when I'm riding a wave. And I don't need to be respected or uh, looked up to or anything, you know, really by anyone. Because surfing is such a divine experience, it transcends all that other stuff, I, I think. At the end of the day, it's, it's an individual choice. Yeah, it's not a team sport, you no, know. And we all, have, we all have our favorites and we all have what we love. And that's the beauty of surfing. Yes, the bottom line is the experience of a few of the waves that I've ridden in my life. That's what I get to take with me, you know? Yes. Those, those are those moments, you know? That's, uh, well, that's what makes us a surfers, I'm right? Thankful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. On your art, looked at a lot of it and I don't know if all of it's this way, but it's waves. Well, that's what people see on Instagram. That's what I see. Yeah. A lot of people don't see what I paint for my jazz musicians. I painted for the basses from Chick Corea, uh, you know, Rick Ferbrazzi's bass player for, you know, the guys from Herbie Hancock, you know, all these other musicians. Wow. I do a lot of contemporary work. I've painted for the pianists from uh, Wayne Shorter and Freddie Hubbard, Mitch Foreman, these paintings. I do a lot of horizontal lines. Like right now I'm looking at a painting I just did. And I've been holding on to it for a while because it's kind of weird to try and deliver it to him. Uh, Griffin Colapinto has this piece. And, yeah, wow. see what I paint. Well, if you go down on my Instagram, you'll see a list of honored clientele. Cool. And it's just stacked with, you know, all these guys. But I've never painted a surfer in my life. And I have never used a photograph or an overhead projector. That's awesome. All this stuff is done from my memory. That's cool. You know, and I'm not saying that's better than in, but it's just what I do. I yeah. don't use photographs, yeah. you know, but yeah, I do. I do a lot of waves partly because I've, yeah, I've stumbled onto this thick, transparent textured stuff. So there's all these different images that I like to 
you know, that I want to do. It's kind of like Monet when he painted, you know, a lily pond. He's like, oh, no, but I want to do one. Okay. And he just keeps repeating those lily ponds because repetition is the mother of perfection, you know? So he's like, you know, I've painted a lot of waves and I keep painting kind of the same angle because I want this, the, I got this angle that I really like. There's a few of these little angles that I like. And so I try and repeat them so that I can fine tune them and get them to be better. So I'm just trying to learn. That's what I do for a long time. And what got me in the Weiland gallery and invited to the lasting gallery and all that is when I was doing panoramic shots of horizons and the water coming in on the sand and the point break or the beach break or the reef break or, and the, but then all the beauty that surrounds it. Now I'm more focusing on just the impact the moment the cylinder, this, the part that the heart of it all. That's so and, cool. And jazz, you know, I've been a jazz drummer since I was a little kid. I've been listening to jazz since I was, Geez, I don't know, 13. Um, my friends used to make fun saying that I was listening to old man music. The thing is, is that jazz is not, people don't even know what jazz is because jazz, people say, oh, this is jazz. And then it's like some, uh, you know, fake funk kind of like smooth jazz jive. Like I'm into like Miles, Coltrane, Bud, Monk. Bird, Dizzy Gillespie, Keith Jarrett, Bill Evans, McCoy Tyner, the pianist from uh, Coltrane, you know, like the drummers like uh, Elvin Jones from uh, who made Coltrane famous. There's so many incredible master jazz players. A lot of them are right in L.A. And uh, when I was little. Uh, my uncles and everybody, what are you going to do with, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And I says, well, I'm going to be a pro surfer and an artist and a jazz drummer and vocalist. Cause That's see, I'm a awesome. jazz singer. I got a slot in the Monterey jazz festival, supposedly coming up. I don't know if it's fallen through or whatever, but this woman has talked about giving me a spot in the Monterey jazz festival uh, I hope because, so. of my, because of my singing, you know, I hope so. I sing Bossa Nova. I sing a little bit in Portuguese but the thing is, is um, see, jazz, jazz, all jazz is, is taking a melody and harmonizing with the melody. And basically, that's like, you know, call and response. It's the same as surfing. The wave is different each time. It's going a different speed. It, you know, uh, mm, you're riding a different board. And then, and then here the wave is calling for this. So it calls and you do a snap, you cut back and you and you and you and you back up and you do a floater on the white water and kind of back up and stall and wait for it it throws over you you hit a turn and here comes a section drive to the section you do that floater you know over the back to try and get around a long point break section and then you hit a turn and you can see that thing double up way down the bay like say at raincon or something so you're surfing to what the ocean is it's is throwing dictating. at you yeah yeah and if and if you and so it's like a dance, right? Yeah. And yeah. so to me, playing drums, you play a supportive role to coach and support the pianist and give him that to get into the triplets and the six, eight fields or whatever he's after. You get to know different pianists and what they prefer and how they want it. Some like the flat ride sound, a real wood stick where real dry. Okay. You want to be real quiet. Other guys want you to lay into it. You know, you learn all these different variables. Those variables are relative to the way you live your life, the way you drive, how mellow you are on the road. I'm kind of a creative driver. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you know, it sounds very so, improvisational. Is that the right word? Yeah. Well, that's what surfing is, man. Yeah, surfing no, I is get totally it. improvisational. These guys, you know, yeah, I get they're, it. They're the very best. They're they're able to adapt and change quickly and quickly. Yeah. Wow. Well, Davey Miller, thank you so much for coming on the Quivercast, man. I am so stoked to be able to talk to you. Fascinating stories, dude. And you're a great storyteller. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, it was fun, man. It was a lot of fun uh, reflecting back on on uh, the divine uh, sport that we've all been 
in love with for for so many years in our life and uh it, it's a ble- it's all a blessing yeah. and to and to get that deep into it and talk and, and remember and and uh it's it's great it's great and i appreciate the opportunity yeah. Oh, no, we had a great time. All right, everybody, this is Mike and Davey Miller, and we are out of here. Yeah, aloha, you everyone. Bye bye. I'm right. Man, this wave is out of sight. Going surfing. Going surfing. Going surfing with friends. Ride this wave to the shore. Paddle out and more. Catch ten more. Going surfing. Going surfing, going surfing with friends. I don't care if it's wrong or right. I'm gonna do it all day. I'm gonna do it all night. I'm going surfing, going surfing, going surfing with friends. Hey guys, Endless Summer Box Set. This thing is legit. It's authentic, numbered certificate in it. It has a five frame film strip from the original print. You will literally own a piece of history. It has a specially minted bronze medallion. Dude, that thing's sick. Okay, there's so much more here. Go to the show notes. There's a link on there. Go check this piece of history out. This thing's rad. Seriously. Smithsonian American History Museum has it. It took four years of research with 3.5 in production. All hand assembled. This thing's rad. So much to this awesome box set. Remastered DVD. Sharper images than the original film. But dude, this thing's so sick. Link in the show notes.